Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor. Thanks for joining me for episode 104. Appreciate you taking the time, and I've got a few stories I'm going to talk about today. Hope everybody enjoyed the last review episode. It certainly was a lot of fun uh, messing around with the Porsche Taycan. Lovely car. Anyway, let me get to some of the stories I'm talking about today. First story is just some news out of Volvo just regarding their uh, movement towards electrification and everything that they're pinning their hopes on electrification right now is based on the CMA platform, which is their compact modular architecture, similar to, you know, Volkswagen with their MEB, um, you know, uh, GM with uh, their platforms, uh, the BEV3 and all this other stuff that's going on. So they have that. Now, the platform has already been used in o building over 60,000 vehicles to date. So it is a proven platform and they have already started building vehicles, especially all electric like the Polestar 2 as an example. Now, two interesting things about the CMA platform is that um, how well all electric vehicles uh, cope with the competition using that platform. And uh, because, you know, again, uh, it's not necessarily a dedicated platform for electricity. Uh, efficiencies, uh, we'll have to watch and see how they do for that. But so far, they seem to be pretty good. And the other thing is that uh, Volvo has predicted that by 2025, they're going to have 50% of their sales uh, will be all electric and the rest will be at least hybrids. So they seem to be moving forward uh, in the right electrification movement. That's great news to hear. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. And of course, the CMA will be the key platform to get them there. Now, some news from Lexus in the UK, they actually started taking online reservations uh, for their UX300e. It's their all-electric uh, compact SUV, if I remember the shape of that. Um, starting price is about £44,000. Then you can get plug-in grants and stuff, which bring the pricing down. Now, it's confirmed that the orders uh, are going to start being opened in October of this year for this vehicle. Um, and first anticipated deliveries are going to be March 2021. Um, one of the biggest surprises of these vehicles is that they're using still Chatamo fast charging. Now, you know, uh, it's not really many vehicles that are going to be maintaining Chatamo. Nissan has just announced with the area platform they're moving away. So it's interesting to see why they're doing that. Some of the specs on this vehicle, it's about a 400 kilometer, 249 mile, of, and that's NEDC range. So you have to take that a little bit lighter for EPA. Uh, it's based on just under 55 kilowatt hour battery pack. One of the key things I picked out of this is that it's air-cooled. Um, but they are offering a 10-year or 1, kilo 1 million kilometer battery warranty. You know, they're going to stand behind it, which is something, I guess. Um, 7.5 seconds, 0 to 100, and all kinds of other specs. 150 uh, kilowatt power, 300 newton meters of torque for the EV. 6.6 .6 charging, and up, up to 50 kilowatts of fast charging. So it's, you know, I have to think about this. It's, it's kind of coming in trying to get a piece of the market there, but based on some older tech, older, not necessarily older technologies, but older uh, features that, you know, most uh, comments that I get on here and people that I talk to, the ex expectation now is to go over and above those type of features. So we'll have to wait and see how successful Lexus is going to be with this uh, platform. Another quick hit from Lucid on the Lucid Air. They've come out with some more numbers before the head of their September full debut that they're doing. Um, they've actually got now an estimated range that they've been testing, EPA estimated, of 517 miles. Yes, 517 miles, folks. You got, I'll put up the kilometers here. Um, so that's a way ahead of the long range Model S. Uh, which tops out at over 400 miles, 402, I believe, on that. So it'll be interesting to see um, if they actually get that reading. Now, they are based on a 900-volt architecture, so they claim that the higher voltage and other improvements helps uh, make this car very, very efficient. I talked about the drag coefficient on one of the last shows uh, being very, very low at 0.21, so yeah, they could be achieving these ranges, so we'll have to wait and see. Um, no firm sizing or estimate yet on the battery pack but it's assumed that it's 130 or so kilowatt hours we'll have to wait and see to give them that kind of range it would have to be pretty hefty to go that distance we know that the model s's are 100 right now and they're getting fantastic range so let's wait and see what lucid comes out with now the big news that came out over the last couple of weeks was the gm cadillac reveal for the lyric uh, all electric their first cadillac's 
full, first full electric vehicle based on the new Altium platform, which GM announced at the GM Day a couple of months ago. Um, so I, I watched that um, live stream, and then I also participated in a media-only uh, call that happened yesterday with some chief engineers from the Cadillac division at General Motors. And uh, they basically reiterated a lot of the information that was on the call, or that was on the live stream. I'm always glad when automakers decide to go full electric, and GM being no exception. So some of the specs on the Lyric, um, again, it is using the Altium system, which is their clean sheet design from a, a drive units and battery uh, cell technology, uh, power electronics and everything, and it's dedicated for EV, for their lineup of EVs. It does comprise of cells from LG Chem, which is one of their partners, their main partner for this. And they're going to have battery pack sizes ranging from 50 to 200 kilowatt hour battery pack sizes because they do plan on using the same pack for their upcoming Hummer release and most likely for the electrified pickup trucks from GMC as well later on. It's comprised of NCMA chemistry with a 70% reduction in cobalt. Um, they can package it differently using prismatic cells. They can use pouch cells. So they can kind of really tailor this to, uh, uh, to many different applications, but they typically are trying to go more toward large format cells. Ranges of up to 645 plus kilometers is what they're claiming for some of the supports on this and all that kind of stuff. Now, on the Lyric itself, as you can see by the pictures and the video and everything, um, it's a beautiful looking vehicle. It's going to offer about 485 kilometers of range estimate right now with fast charging over 150 kilowatts. They don't give an ex uh, explicit number on that. Of course, it'll come with their Super Cruise technology, which they claim they've got over 300,000 miles in North America, 320,000 miles, if I remember correctly, of Super Cruise uh, miles under its belt. So uh, it should be able to map out and drive to most areas under that technology. Level two support up to 19 kilowatts, which is uh, quite large when you can, when it comes to level two. You know, the Porsche Taycan, of course, gets just over 19 as well. And the Model 3 at 11 and a half for level two. So that's pretty good speeds. All kinds of technology and, and alternate reality HUDs and things like that that are going to be in here but uh, you know it's definitely a nice vehicle 50 50 weight distribution no idea on pricing on this but I've heard through the rumor mill that it might start at around 60,000 US we'll have to wait and see if they do that'll be very competitive to that marketplace at least from the electrified so we'll have to wait and see what happens on that Interesting to see this vehicle. Um, anticipation, as far as I asked on the call about uh, ETA dates, and right now they're scheduling this for a 2022 model launch. Uh, the Hummer will actually come out prior to that, and it's based, it'll be GM's first vehicle based on the new Altium platform as a whole from, from GM itself. And uh, uh, that should be coming out sometime next year. We'll have to wait and see. But the uh, Lyric is going to be sometime into 2022. So keep your eyes open for more info on that. Quick news from Volkswagen, they've now actually started production of the ID4, and that seems to be ahead of schedule. Uh, again, back in the Zwickau, Germany plant, this is their second all-electric model based on the VW, uh, sorry, the MEB platform from VW. Of course, the, the MEB platform is being used by other models in the VW group or other vendors, of course. Um, so this is exciting news that they've started serial production of that before even actually officially launching it. There's a launch uh, reveal coming up for the ID4 in early part of September. So we'll get all the specs and everything at that time. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, it's going to start building in Germany, but they will be moving production as well into China and into the U.S. And the U.S. will be the Chattanooga plant for those that are keeping track of that. Um, the launch date is, meant, is mentioned in September to 23rd. And uh, it's interesting where they're still actually building some ICE vehicles in that plant as we speak in conjunction with these newer ID platforms. Cool specs about the plant is they've actually been able to turn that plant around to handle the ID platform capacity and production um, in a very short amount of time. And they've basically been producing vehicles there for 116 years, so it has a lot of heritage. Um, and these are in combination with investments of over 1.2 billion euros. And then they're going to throw more money so that they can commit to um, building 300,000 electric based vehicles on the MEB platform from this plant uh, by the end of next year. So that's a pretty tall order to get this thing up and going. I think they'll be able to do it. 
Last story for today is something a little bit different. This is a uh, from a Chinese manufacturer called Ehang, Ehang, if I got that right. And they presented a version of a fully electrified passenger drone that they have, but they've at actually adapted it for firefighting. And it's called the Ehang 216, as you see by the video and pictures here, specially designed for high-rise firefighting, to be exact. Of course, you're going to get this thing up there, might as well do it. Um, so it can fly up to 600 meters and transport up to 100 150 liters of extinguishing foam and six what they call fire bombs. Now the drone is uh, it uses a thermal uh, imaging camera system to locate the source of the fire and then it fires what's called like a window breaker, some sort of heavy, heavy object to break the windows uh, from a position precisely maintained during ho the hovering flight. Then they throw some fire bombs into that. Uh, and these are intended to distribute the powder known from powder fire extinguishers. So to kind of get a first crack at putting out the, the, uh, the flames with that. Um, and then afterwards they use fire extinguishing foam uh, to remove the oxygen from that space and, and any existing embers of the fire that nest to prevent a renewed outbreak of the fire. Um, they've got several drones right now that they can put together as a bit of a task force to fight a larger fire at the same time and they can get to on site fairly quickly. Uh, so I love how you know we can put these things together and use them in different cases, use cases. This is a great aspect of that especially with all the high rises that are out in China and various parts of the world and I'd love to see it adopted by other uh, firefighting uh, forces throughout the world. A couple last things. I've actually got some mailbag today, so I'm happy to be able to answer a couple of questions. Uh, actually, this was more of an observation. This is from Adam, who's in Michigan. He sent me an email regarding some new quick chargers that are being added across the state. A total of about 76 of them. Apparently, there's not a lot in Michigan. Go figure. Um, he's mentioned that he's seen a lot of them on plug share already, and they seem to be a mix of charge point and green lot uh, stations uh, that are supporting CCS and some Chatham OS. So if you're in that area, you can definitely start finding some new infrastructure, some new level three fast charging stations that are out there, probably some uh, more level twos as well, I would imagine with that. Um, and thanks, Adam, for bringing that to my attention. Appreciate it. And I have another mailbag question from uh, Iman. Iman is here in Canada. Uh, I believe he's on the East Coast, if I remember that correctly. And thank you for sending me the email. I won't get into the details. It's a long one. Basically, he asked about maintenance. He's got a Nissan Leaf and he's asking about, can he take it to other places to get cheaper maintenance? Because sometimes, of course, the vendors, the manufacturers and the OEMs themselves will charge more than you could go, let's say, to another, you know, usual garage, a local garage that you may know or to another chain of garages to get work done. And especially for the warranty to keep, make sure that the vehicle stays within warranty period. So to get those checks that you need done and, and that are based on the maintenance schedules. So I basically mentioned to him, do what you feel that's comfortable. If you read the service and the maintenance information, a lot of it is recommended services that are supposed to be done. And um, you have to make sure that you get the mandatory ones done at least as a minimum. In this case, they're usually battery checks. And for anything that deals with the battery, I would 100% take it to the OEM. I wouldn't take it to anybody else to try to deal with that, even if they say they can do that. If you want them to keep the warranty, go get your checks done so that it's all on file by the OEM, by the manufacturer. Now for things like rotating tires and things like that, those are pretty general things. So I, I, I don't see why you couldn't take it to another shop. Now remember, if it's a Tesla, especially a Model 3, you need those specific jack pads to lift the vehicle up. So they have to be able to know how to jack that up. Any electrified vehicle for that point, there are different stress points on the frame. So I would make sure that they have experience in that if they're going to rotate tires as an example. If not, then again, take it back to the OEM, to the manufacturer, for even that kind of maintenance. Now he asked about brakes and stuff as well because he can get a lot less uh, <laughs> um, paying to get like brake flushes and stuff done by some other people. And I, you know, I, I'm a little iffy on the brakes. Again, I would feel more comfortable with myself going back to the manufacturer, to the to the vendor to get that work done. The brakes are very, are different on an EV, especially in all electric than they are in normal cars because they're used a lot in conjunction with regenerative braking. And there's a little bit, there's more, more computer systems that are going on to balance the, the brake force, uh, you know, the, dis, the, the pad 
pads and the disc working versus the regen and all this and different stuff, especially for one pedal type driving situations, which a lot of the EVs offer today in various modes. So personally, I wouldn't feel comfortable going to another brake shop versus uh, a te going to Tesla or going to Nissan or going to GM or something like that to get it done. That's up to you. If you want to research it and if you feel comfortable in getting that done, like a brake flush and pads and, and disc change, then go for it. For even, but for that stuff, and that's basically the majority of the maintenance that we've talked about already here, and I'm still kind of leaning towards sticking with the OEM and the vendor, the manufacturer itself, to get that work done. You may pay a bit more, but I think you'll, for warranty purposes and for peace of mind, I would feel a little bit better. But again, do your research, make your own judgment call, and and uh, thank you very much for sending me the, the email. I appreciate it. All right, and last thing here is I'm remiss this year. I just kind of remembered that I haven't done my um, EV of the Year award. I started last year in 2019 with my first EV of the Year award, which is the Kia Nero EV or the E Nero. I thought it was a great vehicle and it has done well from a sales perspective. It's unfortunate that Kia can't keep enough, enough of these things in stock uh, to be able to sell. Otherwise, it would have sold a lot more all around great vehicle. So I'm remiss in actually bringing something out for 2020 as the EV model of the year. Uh, well, it's really no surprise, folks. You've been listening to me report on the numbers uh, uh, on a fairly monthly or on a quarterly basis and how things have been doing from plug-in sales and how sales have been over the last year or so. And it's no surprise that this year's winner of the tw of my uh, winner of the 2020 EV of the Year Award goes to Tesla with the Tesla Model 3. And again, it's the number one selling all-electric vehicle globally right now. Uh, it's going to continue to be that way. I think the Model Y will take a chunk out of that, but still, I think a lot of people are flocking to the Model 3 as more uh, competition heats up, though we'll have to see how long that lasts. So no surprise, congratulations to Tesla. I think everybody's kind of uh, <laughs> already know that anyway, but this just makes it official. Uh, I'm gonna send a little note a little and, and a copy of this uh, down to a Tesla for what it's worth, they may not care, but I think uh, just overall seeing how they've come along with the Model 3 in the, in the production uh, and the fit and finish, and you know, there's still some small issues here and there as they're still going through some growing pains. They are a younger company, however, it's much much more solid now you know just and, and the continued software updates have made it a great car and it shows by the sales so congratulations Tesla for this year's 2020 EV model of the year all right guys and that's it uh, for this edition of the EV revolution show thank you very much for tuning in hopefully I helped educate minds one tail pipe at a time is what I like to do again thanks everybody for watching on YouTube please like if you like that if you like what you see uh, put some comments in there subscribe you can also click that bell to get notified when there's a new episode that I put up as well so I do appreciate all that it is important to to comment if you feel like it and to like and subscribe please uh, if you wouldn't mind that would be great again humble thanks to the patreon supporters you know who you are appreciate all the support that i get from patreon if you're interested you can check out the web page uh, i'll let you know a little bit about it i really don't have any type of different clip levels it's just whatever you want even a buck a month a couple of bucks a month a cup of coffee whatever would go a long way continue please everybody to stay safe follow your local health guidelines as we continue to navigate through the the virus with schools opening and and things happening uh, starting to open up a bit more where we may see some additional waves of this so please use your common sense and stay safe and it's going to be an interesting fall with uh, new announcements as i mentioned and i've got a couple more car reviews that'll be coming up over the next few weeks so stay tuned for that coming up and uh, i think that's it looking through my notes here that i have should be it for the show so please everybody stay safe and thanks very much again for tuning in and until the next show i'll see you when i see you take care and bye-bye